corner, which is a little scary, but uh, uh, actually good news. We're, we're, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel and it's not the train. It actually is uh, some good lighting that's out there. So welcome all, I'm Valerie. For those of you that don't know me, Valerie Roshan, uh, head the president of the Chamber Collaborative of Greater Portsmouth and uh, team, some of our team are also on this. Uh, ben Van Kemp is our VP. And Jen is our communications guru, Jen Stevens. So um, they are always supportive. Ben is always driving the Zoom bus for us. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I also see that Councillor Petra Huda is with us today, City Councillor Petra Huda, and Stephanie Secord representing the city. I think that's all that I can see from the city, but thank you for joining us. Um, Speaking of the city of Portsmouth, I'd like to recognize, before we get started, Deputy City Manager Nancy Colbert Puff. She'll be leaving her position as of next Friday. And as many of you know, Nancy has been an outstanding leader at City Hall, always honest, deliberate, thorough, and above all, diplomatic. I've learned an awful lot from her, and I suspect many of you has, have as well. She's been a mentor to me, and how to navigate through city politics and diplomacy. And uh, while I haven't learned everything that I need to know about both of those, she certainly helped me navigate through a lot of it. I wish her great adventures ahead and I'm thankful that we've had the benefit of her knowledge and leadership for these past five years. So if you know Nancy, send her a little note and just, just tell her thank you. A little bit of housekeeping today. Uh, while you'll all be on mute, please use the chat function to ask questions. If we get hijacked, then we'll close the, the meeting immediately. And you should know that all Chamber Chat Live events are recorded and will be posted to our Facebook and YouTube channels next week. So today we're joined by Senator Rebecca Perkins Quoka, and I'm gonna introduce her in a minute. I'm just gonna go through a little bit of Chamber news. But we're really excited to have you here today, Senator. Uh, thank you for making the time to join us. And we're excited to hear about the committees that you're on, you are on and some of the legislation that you're following, plan to propose. And certainly for all of you who are on the call, make sure you start writing down your, chat, your questions or throwing them in the chat box. Uh, while the Senator will speak first, we'll open it up for Q&A after that. And uh, ben will monitor and facilitate the Q&A session at that time. So let me go through a little bit of chamber news. You've got some fun stuff going on. So let's, let's uh, upcoming meetings. We have Let's Talk Tourism on next Wednesday, the 3rd of March. And on Friday, the morning mixer, March 5th, is going to be led by our chamber ambassador, Dan Witham. You all know Dan Witham, and I, you can see his hotel right there on the screen. <laughs> no Dan yet. Um, but Dan's going to be leading that, uh, that for us. And we have uh, Talking Shop on Wednesday, March 10th, when we get all of our retailers together. Also on March 10th, it's a busy day, we have What Every Employer Needs to Know for 2021, presented by Amy Can of HRROY. And she's the former president, I think, of the uh, SHRA, Seacoast Human Resources Association. Association, Association. So she knows what she's talking about. She's gonna speak on what should employers be considering in 2021 after one of the most chaotic years of our lives. That is sponsored by TD Bank and HRROI. Also on the 10th, we have our next restaurant brainstorm meeting where we get as many restaurants together as we can on a Zoom. Uh, during these past meetings, the last couple of weeks, we've been discussing Jersey barriers versus parklets versus platforms. And the restaurateurs have pretty much agreed that Jersey barriers are the most expedient and cost efficient. But what will they look like? There's some concerns in our discussions about eye pollution and driver distraction. And so currently the restaurants are recommending to the Blue Ribbon Committee and also to the city that we use one or two colors and make them a little bit more homogenous as opposed to everybody um, doing a different color or different designs. Um, just want to keep it classy and keep it uh, less distracting because all of these barriers go down in some of the busiest streets in downtown. 
So right now we're talking with uh, the CTE program at Portsmouth High School, perhaps to engage the students in painting those barriers and perhaps even building some planters to go on top of the barriers. So that's an ongoing discussion. If you're a restaurant, if anybody here is in, owns a restaurant, get your applications into the city as soon as possible if you wanna go out onto the streets. So we know how many of which barriers we need. It's important to get that as soon as possible. It's a little scary You think that Monday is March 1st. March 1st, anybody who has a sidewalk permit can open, can bring their tables and chairs back out into the public realm, not onto the streets, but anywhere on the sidewalks or in your private parking lot or under a tent or wherever it is, that wherever it is that you want to do that, that is not on the street. And then of course the barriers drop on April 1st. So uh, you know, let's hope we have some really nice weather. And if we don't have nice weather, just dress in really warm clothes and get out there and support our businesses. And along that line, you have seen that the, the city has throw, has put out some picnic tables 10 picnic tables all over downtown. And you know, I drove through downtown yesterday, the picnic tables were packed. People are loving it. We're trying to support our local takeout businesses. Go out there, get your lunch, get a snack, get a coffee, get whatever it is, and go and sit on one of those picnic tables and watch the world going by. So they're already incredibly popular. Uh, they are three-sided so that there's still room on the fourth side for uh, uh, wheelchair access. So well done, city and and in uh, Wyman. I'm going to ask Ben to talk about the save the saving the day for the economic outlook. Ben, would you jump in here for us, please? Yeah, happy to. Um, we're excited to have uh, our economic outlook event come back. Um, it will be held on the 30th of March. That's a Tuesday. We're going to do it in the morning this time. Um, we're going to be 8:30 in the morning at the Seacoast Repertory Theater. We will have a limited number of um, in-person available uh, tickets, um, but it will be live streamed thanks to our friends at the Rep um, so that everyone can watch it from their home or home office or office. Um, so we're excited to welcome Will Arvello back as our keynote speaker. Will is the Director of Economic Development for the state of New Hampshire. And we have some other great speakers in the works that we will be announcing shortly. So mark the March 30th, Tuesday morning at 8.30 in your calendars, please. Thanks, Ben. One last note, um, we have a tourism position manager, tourism manager position open for which we are currently interviewing and hope that we will have somebody all settled in by the end of March. So uh, keep, uh, keep checking back on that. Anytime you wanna know what's going on uh, with the chamber, visit our calendar at portsmouthcollaborative.org for business news and events. You get the source weekly every Wednesday. That's Jen telling you everything that's going on. She's giving you all sorts of great tidbits of information and what's what's happening. Um, she also sends out a quick, uh, here's what's going on during the week, you know, sort of events that you should check against your calendar on Mondays. And you should be following the city manager's advisory, which comes out multiple times a week, and you can sign up at the cityofportsmouth.com. So a reminder that we'll open up for questions once uh, the senator has spoken and enter your questions through the chat function. So, Senator Rebecca Perkins Quoka, thank you so much for being here. Tell us everything that's happening in Concord. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so nice to be here with all of you guys. Um, and I wanna, I'll talk briefly, but I do wanna kind of focus on what's, what's of interest and answer your questions. So I'll just give a little overview, but um, as with, Every year, the legislature is off to a busy start, and um, you know there's over 1,100 bills on every subject under the sun, from education to wow. business funding to um, you know I'm trying to think of some of the more bizarre ones we've seen: lobster meat packaging, um, you know, all sorts of different topics that you end up learning about and trying to understand, you know, as quickly as you can to make sure um, nothing's getting overlooked. So we in the Senate have been meeting completely remotely. Um, and that was announced after our orientation in December after the unfortunate passing of the House Speaker. Um, so we've had all of our committee hearings remotely. We've had all of our sessions remotely. And um, we've had a 
few snafus, but um, it seems that we've been able to conduct our business efficiently. And, um, you know, actually, I feel like we're getting really good public participation because of the virtual nature of the hearings. Um, I don't know how closely any of you have time to follow the legislature, but there have been some hearings in the House um, where over 3,000 people have signed in in support or opposition of a bill, which, you know, having been kind of a state house junkie on and off over the years is just, um, it's cool to see that level of participation in what's going on in Concord. So I, I'm interested to see how uh, everything have, continues to unfold and happens going forward. But I think for now, one thing we've learned is that, um, you know, being remote has really enabled participation at the state house and in Concord. So it's been an interesting way to start. Um, you know, we've had some really good chances to work together, um, you know, on most bills in the Senate, I would say, you know, the attitude has been very much focused on the technical nature of the bills in front of us and what needs to be done. There have been a few partisan issues, um, which I'm sure you guys have heard about as well and happy to talk about anything um, specific out of those subjects that's interesting to you. I am on the election law and municipal affairs committee, um, mostly because of my background on city council and um, in housing advocacy, but then also have been kind of an election nerd for most of my life. So that's a busy committee this year. There are over 80 pieces of election related legislation between the House and the Senate. And so, um, you know, trying to make sure that we're listening to everybody and getting elections right is, is an important part of what I've been doing up there. And then I'm also on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, which Senator Fuller Clark served on. So, um, you know, I work in renewables and happy to try to lend that experience and expertise to the committee. Um, it's, it's been great so far. We have about 250 bills to get through in the Senate before crossover. And then in April, we'll start to hear the over 800 House bills, um, at least the ones that survive and, and come to us. And so um, it'll be a busy spring and um, I think it'll get busier before it gets quieter, but um, you know, it, it feels like a good time to be involved. And, um, and so I'm, I'm grateful to be having the experience and learning from my colleagues around me. Um, and so I'm, I think I'm gonna kind of stop there, Valerie, and see what's of interest to folks. I'm happy to talk a little bit about housing legislation. And then um, I have a piece of legislation that's um, supporting some of the newer businesses in town. So um, happy to hit those or whatever is of interest to people. You know, let's hit those first, Rebecca, if you don't mind. Um, I have a number of questions that I that I would like to ask, but I, I think what we'd love to hear is particularly this legislation, this Main Street Relief legislation that I know that you're working on. I know that it's of particular interest to some of the folks that are on the call. Okay. So why don't we start there if you don't mind? Sure, I'd love to. So over the summer, um, I spent a lot of time visiting with uh, businesses around town and throughout the district to hear how their experience had been accessing PPP, EIDL, Main Street, um, you know, the GAP program, different different fundings and and um, sort of programs that had been unveiled very quickly. You know, the eligibility for those had been determined by the governor's office on economic recovery and relief, so Gopher, and just hearing. Um, how that had been for many businesses. And one of the gaps that I identified early on was that um, in the Main Street program, businesses that were formed after May 30th, 2019 had been left out of that program and were excluded just based on the age of their business, which is not, um, it's not a federal part or it's not a federal eligibility requirement. The aid that was given to the state is discretionary. And so, that particular date was chosen um, by the state and, and those businesses were excluded by the state rules. And so um, I, I wanted to put in a piece of legislation on that. And then as I approached the deadline, um, I tried to work with one of our businesses in town pretty closely through their appeal process. And 
um, you know, we we quickly discovered that even the appeal process was not very robust and it, it wasn't designed to hear, um, you know, the kinds of substantive concerns that an appeal traditionally would. It was really focused on typographical errors and, and all of this to say, you know, I think it's important that the support that was unveiled, you know, happened quickly and and hindsight is 2020, but just knowing that this was a gap for businesses, I wanted to make sure that we were trying to support them in the ways that we could going into this year. So I have a piece of legislation. It It's simple in its nature. It says that if the state does receive further federal funds that are discretionary, that a portion of those funds be allocated to businesses that were formed after May 30th, 2019. Um, and I've convened a couple meetings with different groups um, of small businesses that you know are hoping to testify at the hearing next Tuesday and through conversation with them I think there's probably some other fixes that we need as well including um, the formula that's used to determine whether revenue went up and down it seems to be somewhat unsophisticated because it doesn't incorporate for example increased expenses along with increased revenue as one example or being able to compare quarters across different owners, um, you know, is another concern. So the bill itself, like I said, is, is simple and focuses on future discretionary federal funding for these newer businesses. Um, but then it also seems like there's some, a, a couple additional pieces that I'm hoping to continue to work with these businesses on and hopefully address either through an amendment to the bill or through a letter to go for as we move forward. So if I can just be clear on something, um, Senator, this cannot, we're not finding that through the appeals process, this cannot be applied to the Main Street funds that have already been allocated. Are there no Main Street funds left to be allocated? It has to be in the next round. Is that is that what you found? Yeah, unfortunately that's correct, Valerie. I've talked with Gopher pretty extensively about the process and basically, um, you know, because they were trying to act quickly, which again is appreciated, um, you know, the funds that were in the original Main Street program have all been allocated. And I think that's part of why the appeal process is difficult because the application has to happen quickly and the disbursements have been happening quickly, which is a good thing. But um, in the case where a business owner didn't understand a question <laughs> or something on their application um, and were denied, there was really no way to go back and fix that. And now many businesses are simply having to wait um, for the next round of federal funding. And so when I put this legislation in, there was none of that funding proposed, but under President Biden's $1.9 million or $1.9 trillion um, economic relief package, there is uh, discretionary aid proposed to the states that um, this bill would control. That will be incredibly helpful for those that just got, they just got caught in the middle, as you say, you know, they just, they just got fell, they just fell through the cracks and, and they are sometimes in cases even more susceptible to the to the up and down of the revenues just having taken over a new business. So that's great that you're doing that. Thank you. I see that we do have a question, Ben, if you want to move forward with that. A question about the funding um, that was cut out of the governor's budget for the SBDC. Um, you know, as uh, another organization that works with a lot of business, small business owners, we've uh, seen them provide a tremendous service over the past year. And uh, the question is your thoughts on getting them refunded. Yeah, I, I think this is hugely important. Um, I, and I'm always happy to hear the feedback that others have found SBCD, SBDC to be helpful because, um, you know, I spoke to them over the summer. I heard their name several times. I was very impressed with everything they've been doing. And I know they just went through a big expansion. Um, and so it seems to me that what business owners were facing over the last year was essentially trying to not only run their business, which of course is an act of incredible <laughs> fortitude and survival and creativity, um, but learn all sorts of new subjects, including interpreting new regulations, applying for new programs, you know, just trying to stay on top of a new, a whole new host of things. And so 
having any helping hand, which the SBDC seems to have done an excellent job on, um, is was needed, and um, and I'm very grateful that they were there. So, I'm, I was really disappointed to see the funding so reduced next year, and then zeroed out the year after. And um, I know for our part, um, where I'm addressing that is is through the Senate Democratic Caucus. We've been discussing how we can, um, you know, sort of try to bolster that funding. I don't know if that will come in the form of a budget amendment that we propose um, or whether, you know, we'll be able to just kind of deal with it through the Senate Finance Committee, but um, but it's certainly something of great concern. And I, I for one, would be very supportive of uh, fighting for additional funding for SBDC because I think they've done an excellent job. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad that you're supporting that, uh, su uh, Senator, because even just even just for the seacoast area, uh, the resiliency surveying that they're doing, the one that they did last fall, uh, the city was good enough to pay for them to drill down even further for Portsmouth and our area. And the information that we get out of that was so important, critically important to know how our businesses are doing and what they needed next. And as you know, the latest version of that closed this past Friday, a week ago, and they expect to have the results of that out in middle of March. Once again, the city has stepped up and paid to have it drilled down yet again to the Portsmouth area, so we know that. And then they're planning another one, I think it's in August, correct me if I'm wrong there, but I, I think the next resiliency survey will be next August. And that is so critical for us to actually catalog how our businesses are doing whether they're down or up and what more they need. So any support we can get for the SBDC's budget would be greatly appreciated. I think we have some more questions, so. Yeah, uh, and it, if I could just add, Valerie, I mean, I would I would be so happy to hear individual stories or if there are businesses that you think were um, particularly affected by SBDC because I'm sure a part of it will be trying to to highlight, you know, the specific ways that SBDC has has helped, even though we all know they've been really helpful, you know, those stories always are powerful. So if anyone wants to connect me with someone who, um, you know, has been particularly impacted, I would appreciate that. That's sounds great. Like Pro, sounds like Pro Portsmouth might be one of those folks. It sounds that way from the chat. Yeah, I see that. I see that, which is critical. So Barbara, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll ask you to help us out there as well. And Jen, if I could ask you to put that in the source next week, just put that question out next week to all of our members, see who has actually been supported by SBDC and connect them directly with the Senator. And that will be very helpful. If I can ask you to do that, thank you. Thanks so much. No other questions immediately in the chat, but I know you have a whole list there, Valerie. So <laughs> I, always <do. laughs> I always do. You mentioned election related uh, legislation. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to go into that just a little bit and tell us what maybe the top tier of those of that legislation is, please? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll mention a few highlights. So, um, you know, one piece of legislation that's been brought forward is to to have fully no excuse absentee voting encoded into law, um, which is what we essentially had for the COVID state of emergency. I don't know how much drama everyone entangled themselves in related to the election, but I know um, there was originally an absentee ballot where you had to um, check the disability box if the reason you did not want to vote in person was due to COVID. Um, they then printed a second version of the absentee ballot that um, that specifically had a COVID reference. And so that was what I think many people used. Um, and the election by all accounts went very smoothly. There were three recounts across the state and then there was one incident in Wyndham um, where there was essentially an election anomaly. And so um, given the record turnout um, that the Secretary of State cataloged, you know, um, there's a movement to just make no excuse absentee voting permanent under New Hampshire law, which is something that exists in many states across the country. So 
That's one piece. Um, another piece that's completely in the other direction is to um, was a piece of legislation that originally proposed to require um, a physical photocopy of someone's driver's license to be mailed in alongside an absentee ballot. Um, and on that one, we heard a lot of testimony about the challenges of that, um, particularly for rural older voters or um, voters with disabilities who obviously face enough challenges trying to participate. So um, that bill was amended to simply um, now ask that the last four digits of your driver's license are written down on your absentee ballot application um, or other identifying information you can discuss with the town clerk. So that version of the bill, um, we have voted out of committee, it passed on partisan lines. And so that will be in front of the Senate as a whole. Um, another piece of related legislation that um, perhaps many here have followed or haven't um, is independent redistricting. So um, as you may know, this year is a census year. And so when the census results are released, which just got delayed from next July to next September, um, our districts are supposed to be redrawn in the state to proportionately make sure that each district represents the same amount of population. Um, it has become unfortunately a political process across the country. That's how we have gerrymandering. And, um, and so we, there was a bill both in the House and the Senate to form an independent redistricting committee. That committee would have merely been advisory to the legislature. So the legislature is who passes those redistricting maps ultimately. Um, unfortunately, in the Senate, the main bill for that independent committee was um, voted in expedient to legislate by the Senate. And so the House version is still out there. Um, I have another bill that just, it's a somewhat scaled back, it says, um, that any meetings held by any committee that deal with redistricting do need to be public. The maps need to be made available and um, the meetings need to have digital access. Anything that's paid for by taxpayer money needs to be available to both parties. So that will be up for a public hearing on Monday. Um, and then in like a logistical um, bill, I was asked to bring legislation by the town clerks that allowed for use of something called electronic poll books, um, which simply allows for quicker voter check-in when you come in and it allows the clerks to close the rolls more quickly at the end of the night. Um, it will be, after many amendments, it will be authorized for check-in, hopefully this year for municipal elections for towns and cities that wish to use it alongside of a paper backup system for now for the transition. So. Those are some <laughs> that might be interesting to folks. You have a busy season ahead. Just to say <laughs> that much, my goodness. Uh, yeah. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here. You and I both attended the Offshore Wind webinar earlier this week, mm. which is incredibly exciting uh, that the um, uh, Maine coast and the New Hampshire coast could be considered and, and perhaps I think the case was being made should be considered for wind and a turbine and that type of energy. And knowing that you live in the energy world, can you just share your thoughts with, with us about the offshore wind, please? Yeah, yeah, I, um, I'm a bit of a wind nerd, so <laughs> I'll try not to, to go on too long, but um, in my previous position, I was involved in a lot of onshore wind development and, um, I think wind turbines are a pretty cool technology, but uh, so the opportunity in the Gulf of Maine is that the wind resource there is one of the best wind resources in the world. And there's enough wind power in the Gulf of Maine to provide all the power needed for the six New England states 10 times over. And so it's a huge opportunity um, to, you know, provide this renewable resource, but to do it in a way that balances a lot of needs. It's a very sophisticated um, calculation of, of many factors that will go into it. And so where the process is right now is that um, there is a BOEM task force, which is meeting, that's the Bureau of Oceans and Energy Management. And 
that's the federal agency that kind of oversees the whole process. We up here in the Gulf of Maine in the tri-state region, um, north of Massachusetts, don't have any authorized lease areas yet. So nobody can do anything just yet. Just to get those lease areas authorized is optimistically a two-year process. Um, in off of Manhattan, that process has taken um, more than three years already. And so what will happen at some point to begin the process um, will be that the states all agree that they want to formally request that and lease areas will be designated. Um, what's interesting about the federal and state waters is that state waters only extend three miles off coast. So those are the only waters that are jurisdictional in this process. The rest is federal property and leased by the federal government. However, um, the power from these offshore projects obviously needs to come onshore and connect into our grid so that we can all use it. And so it's commonly sort of thought that um, it's better not to develop wind turbine projects offshore within three miles because, um, you know, A, those are very close and B, they're state jurisdictional waters. And so um, when there's a federal process, it can be more uniform. In addition, you know, I think um, at least what I've heard is many developers recognize that the view shed is very important and um, it makes sense to be at least 10 miles offshore, if not farther, um, more like 30 miles offshore at the closest point. And so um, in many cases, we wouldn't be able to see them. And here in New Hampshire, we're lucky because our jurisdictional waters actually extend beyond the Isles of Shoals. Um, and so we have a bigger area that's kind of protected by those islands um, from that view shed to have the turbines kind of be farther offshore. One of the challenges will be when that power does come onshore through transmission cable is where to do that and, and how. And um, because of the size of these projects, uh, they're making you know individual turbines that are 12 megawatts, which doesn't mean much except to say that you know they're bigger than the back of um, any of these like big oil tankers that come into the harbor, they're real big. <laughs> and so the amount of power that you can bring in from an individual project is a lot. And so, you know, being able to connect that to the grid in a place where there's already a lot of equipment designed to kind of transition that power into smaller voltages um, to store some of it perhaps through battery storage um, and make sure that it can kind of safely make its way into the grid, into cables that are the right size is, is a big part of what will also be needed for the calculation. And so obviously we have Schiller Station, we have Newington Station, we have Seabrook here in New Hampshire, which are all um, potentially possibilities for that in the near and long term. Um, and then there's, I think in addition to all that kind of <laughs> nerdy <laughs> stuff that goes on out in the water, you know, I think there's huge opportunity in our district for, for jobs and pipeline and technology. Um, and so I know, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about sort of like how close to the water is there land available for construction lay down, you know, um, for inventory storage, for part storage, for spare parts to go out and do maintenance on these turbines, um, you know, for folks to get on the boats to go out in service and build these. Um, and so I think, you know, the way I think about it is it's more like a when, not an if, but it's definitely something that I think we should start thinking about how our community colleges can start to support. How can our, um, you know, sort of technical career paths start to support and look towards that in a flexible way. And um, there's even just stuff like you get down to these little details, like the turbines are a floating technology now. And so they're held in place by big chains. Um, and in order to create the torque to, to place those chains um, uh, for the turbines, you need a special kind of tugboat and a special kind of crew that isn't available up here. So should we manufacture tugboats? I mean, there's just endless number of details that um, I think could affect our area. And I'm certainly excited <laughs> for the prospects of, um, but I think it will be, it'll be many years and um, there'll be a lot of public input from what I understand.
I'm sure that there were because we, <laughs> we need to balance all needs. So, uh, and there, are, you know, there's a lot of consideration, obviously, marine life and tourism and um, fishermen and, you know, all sorts of, of stuff that needs to be balanced. I'm happy to see Sean Clancy from Great Bay Community College on the call. I sent him over the recording of that webinar earlier today with a little, with, and I'm sure he's been on top of it before I even mentioned it, but I'm like, yeah, this looks like something the college might want to be involved with. Sean and, would actually like to chime in on that. If you excellent, can. excellent, great. great, thanks, Sean. And you gotta unmute yourself, Sean. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, everybody. Uh, great to be here. I, I actually represent CCSNH on the on Senator Waters Commission. Cool. And we've been meeting every month since November. Uh, and what uh, to, to add to your point about it's a it's, it is a long process. However, there's a there's a whole construction phase, and and um, the commission is actually called uh, offshore wind and port development um, because to your point about um, all the all these services that are going to be needed through construction through servicing literally building these new types of ships that will service the turbines which uh, i know from my old life need to be american built i think at this point you can, they need to be so that that even helps the shipbuilding uh, aspect of it but mm -hmm. there, there's a lot to it and it's all about workforce and the economy and, and energy and all the things we talk about here in new hampshire and across new england so it's a long-term opportunity. And just recently, the governor's office of offshore wind now has an occupant. I think it mm -hmm. was open for a couple of years. Um, so that's progress. Someone's sitting in that role and, and working on it full time. And, and uh, it, it's definitely exciting, uh, but it's a, it is a long haul. Yes. <laughs> Which is, which is which is great because you've got to get them all trained, Sean. So uh, <laughs> that's why I'm there. We'll have them ready. We'll have the the uh, workforce ready by the time we're we're needing them. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> I also appreciate uh, Rebecca. When I was watching this the other day, a lot of this technology was like shoot right over my head. Um, particularly the floating. <laughs> they started talking nerdy, and when they're talking about the floating. <laughs> I'm thinking, how can you have this massive wind turbine, turbine that's floating out there? So thank you for giving me a little bit more insight on that. I, I, no, I don't see how that happens. <laughs> so, thank you for that. So um, I'm just looking for other, I don't want to step on anybody else, but um, okay, seeing none, Ben. I'm just going to continue on with my, with my questions, if that's all right, for just another moment or two, Rebecca, and then I'll ask you to to sum up if you don't if you don't mind. Sure. So it's just a couple of quick questions. The uh, when is the crossover in April? Do you have that date by any chance? Um, our deadline to act, I think, is March 27th. So I think the bills will come over between then and April 1st. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned Gopher earlier, and I'm not sure if you have any, and I'll bring this up with Taylor as well, with Commissioner Caswell as well, but there's some real concern, particularly from the restaurants, as the guidelines are changing constantly, that they're not being communicated. And we've discussed this before with Gopher, um, that these, while the guidelines say on the bottom of them, each time they're updated, it has the date of update. We don't know what was really changed and we don't know when it was changed. Mm. So you have to, the, so the restaurants in particular, and I'm sure the hotels and retailers are looking at this as well, but particularly for those folks that, or, or summer camps or the bottom line is they need to know, there needs to be some communication. I don't know if you have any input on this. I don't know if you have any thoughts about it. But I, I know that it's it's they want to follow the guidelines. They want to do what's most right. And they're they're stumbling a little bit. And so if there's anything that you can do to to see if we can get better communication when the guidelines change, that would be incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, so in other words, something as simple as a red line would be appreciated, um, but even better might be some more public input. Right. I mean, it's not like the state doesn't have the email of everybody who's got a license, right, to run a hotel or run a restaurant or even own a retail shop. So sure. that's like a that sounds like a quickie thing to me. Yep. But yep. No, I know. No, so, I can bring that up. Thanks. That would be that would be awesome. Thank you. 
Do we have any other questions or any other notes from anybody, Ben? Nope. Well, we've covered a lot of stuff this morning, uh, this afternoon, actually, sorry, uh, Senator. We certainly appreciate that. And I know that you're trying to squeeze this in while your daughter's napping. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that as well. That's fantastic. Although, quite frankly, personally, I'd rather, I'd rather see her. <laughs> so do you want to do a little wrap up and uh, then we'll move on to our entertainment for the day? Yeah, sure. Um, it's been so nice to be here with you guys. I always appreciate hearing from you. I've I've been in touch um, with a lot of businesses throughout the last year, but I always I always welcome each experience is unique, and um, I love to hear the stories of the resiliency and and will to survive that's gone on over the past year. I think it always presents the opportunity that maybe there's some way we can better support you um, at the state level. And so please always feel free to reach out. I put my email and phone number in the chat, um, but they're publicly available. So, you know, um, always always happy to hear from you and, um, and be aware of what's going on on the ground for you and where there are gaps. So um, with that, I'll probably wrap up and just say that we didn't talk about housing today, which is my favorite subject, but, um, please know that that's, that's just one of the priorities that I came prepared to fight on and conquered and the ways that housing affordability have affected all of us. They've affected our demographics, our employee availability, um, our rents and, and so many other things. And so um, I continue that fight up in Concord. And um, unfortunately we had a setback yesterday where one of our main bills got tabled, but, um, but we're not, that easy to defeat. So I, I will continue to work on it and always happy to talk about that too. Thank you for having me. Well, having worked with you on affordable and workforce housing while you were on city council, I can attest to the fact that you will, you will not go away quietly. <laughs> I am very appreciative that's of that. That's good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am very, very appreciative of that. Thank you. Um, we are we are so lucky that you took the time to, to talk with us today and I really appreciate that Senator thank you for your time and for your for fighting for us continuing to fight for us and and for your continuing representation in uh, well in Concord whether it's <laughs> in person or not but I know, I know. Uh, but in Concord so I'm going to wrap up with a couple little things here please please stay with us and thank you for posting your email and your phone so that folks can reach out to you. And uh, we will use that when Jen sends out in the source in our weekly e-newsletter e next Wednesday so that people can get in touch with you uh, about SBDC in particular, but anything else that they want to chat with you about. So thank you. Thank you. Um, our next chat is going to be Friday, March 12th. We try for the second and fourth Fridays of the month. We always invite you to tell us who you want to speak with, what's on your mind, who do you want to talk to, uh, uh, who do you want to hear from. So please do that. And I'm always reminding you, you know, we've got the vaccinations that are happening now. I'm very excited. Mine's coming up in another week. Can't wait. So we're feeling better about things, but we know that we have to keep wearing a mask. We have to keep social distancing. We have to keep washing our hands. Nothing, none of that has gone away yet uh, and probably won't as I understand it for a little while. But the good news is that few and fewer of us will get uh, hopefully sick enough to be hospitalized and we can stay out of the hospitals. So when it's your time, please go get vaccinated. In the meantime, wear a mask. And even once you are vaccinated, you still have to wear the mask because it has not been proven yet that you can no longer transmit. So please be respectful. I always uh, talk about this. Remember that it takes 11 hugs a day to thrive, not just to survive. And since we can't hug in person, please hug each other with uh, kind words and smiles and something fun or funny, or just even uh, drop a note or a quick text to somebody and just say you're thinking about them. We all need that. We try to end our Fridays, because it is Friday, 
and we're ready for it to be Friday on a happy note or an inspirational note or a funny note or something, something fine and funny so that you leave uh, for the weekend feeling, feeling happy. And today we have musician Martin Sexton. He's an American singer songwriter and a music producer who will be performing live and live streamed from the music hall tomorrow night, Saturday at 8 p.m. There are still tickets available. I, uh, I checked on that. So visit the musichall.org to get your tickets. In this time of radical views on the way left and the way right, this song by Martin is about calling America, America to get along. It was filmed January 22nd at Club Passim in Cambridge, Mass. Mm -hmm. It's a little more longer than what we would normally play. It's about um, three minutes and 30 seconds, but if you have three minutes and 30 seconds to spare, there's Logan. <laughs> we did and get the baby after all. You did, and Logan and I just want to quickly say before you play your three minutes and 30 seconds song, we just want to thank you, Valerie, for all of your service to the chamber. I know you announced your retirement this week and so we just want to say thank you for all that you've done and your tireless advocacy on behalf of Portsmouth and its businesses and so we're we're sad to see you go but i um, happy that you'll be spending more time with your grandchildren and Logan says bye and thank you <laughs> thank you Logan thank you Rebecca I appreciate that I've, I've you know how much I've enjoyed working with you for these years so 